A UN expert has urged the United States to close down its Guantanamo Bay prison. She has said the country's treatment of prisoners is the biggest barrier to ensuring justice for the victims of the 9-11 attacks. Guatemala's runoff election for a new president on August 20 will be a center-left versus center-right contest as left candidate Thelma Cabrera and two others were controversially disqualified before the election. China will host four prime ministers from four continents in the coming Summer Davos Forum starting Tuesday, and a coming visit from the governor of a key Japanese province will complete the diplomatic circle. These are our stories today on Daily Debrief. Finuala Ni Aulen, the UN Special Rapporteur, has said the United States should apologize to inmates of its Guantanamo prison for their systematic torture ongoing for just over two decades. It has just 30 inmates today and 16 are due for release. And there has been widespread international opprobrium, but the wide range of indignities and rights violations at Guantanamo make the sufferings of inmates profound and unprecedented. Abdul has been tracking the story for People's Dispatch and he joins us now over Zoom. Abdul, thanks for joining us. Abdul, what has the special rapporteur Ni Olen said in her report? Well, uh, she was, uh, she's the first UN expert to visit the infamous illegal Guantanamo Bay uh, detention center. Uh, she was allowed to visit for the first time in the last 21 years uh, of his existence. And after visiting uh, the prison, she basically prepared a detailed report about the basic treatment of the detainees. There are 30 detainees still remaining in the prison, which has a history of more than 700 uh, detainees coming, going, in last 21 years. And she says that the treatment of, uh, of these detainees by the US authorities is basically inhuman and degrading. Uh, uh, she basically uh, mentions that the, the, the US uh, prison authorities have used torture and other unlawful uh, uh, methods to, uh, on these prisoners. They have been basically uh, violated uh, time and again. And it is time to basically shut down the prison. And uh, it basically demands the, that US authorities apologize uh, formally to all the detainees uh, 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 and provide compensation to whoever has been there in the prison. It also talks about that uh, there is a need uh, that US basically uh, uh, remove all the names, all the previous detainees' name from its uh, so-called terrorist watch list, which uh, this is a strange uh, thing that despite the fact that uh, uh, some of the detainees were kept inside uh, the Guantanamo Bay prison illegally for years, they were tortured, uh, inhuman practices, uh, uh, subjected to inhuman practices. Despite that, US authorities were not able to frame any charges against them. And, uh, and they were released after years of uh, this uh, detention. And still, US authorities, after releasing them, keeps them on a terrorist watch list. So she also uh, mentions that they should, these names, whoever has been released, should, their name should be removed so that their rehabilitation is uh, uh, possible and that these people live normally. So these are the basic findings of uh, 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 Ni's uh, uh, report. And she basically talks about the uh, accountability uh, to be established uh, for whoever has been responsible for, uh, uh, for this particular uh, kind of uh, illegal uh, detention facility. Abdul, there have been other reports, there have been many agitations against uh, the kind of conditions in Guantanamo Bay in the detention center. Now, what is the special significance of this report? And is it also important to note that she has made a link between the lack of justice for the 9-11 victims and the way the, the prison system has treated these uh, inmates? Well, uh, you are right uh, that there have been many other reports. Uh, from the beginning of the uh, this uh, the establishment of the Guantanamo Bay Prison Center uh, in uh, to, since 2002 onwards, you find very newspaper reports 
and in particular uh, the most important uh, revolution was made by the publication of uh, the gitmo files by the wikileaks in 2011 which basically details uh, how uh, the us authorities use uh, a premeditated set of uh, illegal uh, abusive methods against the prisoners uh, to basically extract false uh, uh, confessions false witnesses against each other so yeah that is correct uh, uh, so this is not nothing new but the uh, one thing which needs to be uh, underlined that us has basically finally agreed the, uh, that the un expert uh, for the an uh, un expert visit so that is a new thing that uh, she was the first person to as an un reporter to visit the detention center and uh, uh, interview some of the detainees there so that is something which has not been uh, uh, the, uh, reported earlier so apart from that yes uh, she has made a link that the see if you see terrorism uh, as a, a illegal uh, act in human act uh, and and uh, the the victims of the 911 basically need justice no doubt about it but that does not mean that innocence and the people who have not there has been no legal uh, 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 evidence against them uh, need to suffer because a uh, nine level victims have not got justice uh, uh, injustice against some other does not mean justice for uh, uh, for uh, some so and that is the basic thing on which the uh, the legal systems ideally should work uh, us has violated uh, this basic principle time and again while maintaining the guantanamo bay and other uh, uh, black sites in different other parts of the world and uh, 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 and that basically the thing which needs to be uh, underlined and that is what the report does we are not sure whether the us authorities will still hear listen to what uh, 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 the report says and has been uh, told uh, to them repeatedly uh they have a record of not uh, listening to such reports in fact even after the publication of this particular report the us uh, authorities basically tried to uh, 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 trivialize it saying that we do not violate any international law and we are trying to uh, treat the prisoners with uh, as per the international law and the laws of the land the us uh, denying the basic fact that the, the uh, uh, guantanamo bay was established to bypass the international law and the law of the us law itself so yeah that is that has been the standard practice and we we don't know whether the justice will be done or not but yeah abdul we just have time for one quick question more you know what about the timing of allowing this visit and then the report coming out this, like you said just 30 inmates left now out of several hundred before well uh, biden uh, during his election campaign and uh, after resuming office had promised that he will shut down the uh, guantanamo bay prison he uh, just like obama did but so far if you see the latest uh, set of reports says that the us administration has gone back to his promise and now they are saying they will shut down eventually earlier they said by 2024 now they say eventually it will be shut down and uh, it will take time so that is one thing which basically indicates the pressure which is there in the us larger river politics to maintain such kind of illegal uh, establishments right abdul thanks a lot for joining us none of the 22 candidates in sunday's presidential poll in guatemala got the required 50% votes people expressed their discontent as many voters stayed away or submitted blank votes Sandra Torres of the Center Right National Unity of Hope and Bernardo Arevalo of the Center Left Semilla Movement will contest in a runoff even combined these two candidates could not secure half the votes there's a widespread mood of protest in the country facing numerous simultaneous challenges Zoe Alexandra of People's Dispatch discusses this election Zoe can you first tell us what happened in the election held on Sunday in Guatemala Yes, well, on Sunday, June 25th, the people of Guatemala went to the polls to elect uh, their next president, vice president, members of the parliament, members of the Central American parliament, as well as mayors and councillors for 
um, municipalities across the country. And uh, these were historic elections um, and not in necessarily a positive way. Um, these elections were really characterized by um, low participation and also a large number of protest votes. So uh, in a Guatemala is a small country, the number of people who are eligible to vote in these elections was 9.3 million. So of these 9.3 million, uh, according to the uh, Supreme Electoral Tribunal, about 5.5 people, 5.5 million people uh, participated. So already um, pretty low, not quite at 50%, but uh, quite low participation. And of the 5.5 million people who did participate, 1.3 million of them cast blank or no votes. So some of these could be chalked up to people not uh, filling in um, the ballot correctly, but many of these uh, were actually blank votes um, and protest votes in some way. So uh, it's it was definitely uh, abstention and protest was, were really the winners in these votes. And you can tell that from the numbers um, essentially in these elections, it was confirmed that there will have to be a second round, a runoff election, um, wherein Sandra Torres, who is the former first lady, uh, she will be facing off um, uh, Bernardo Arevalo. They're going to go to the second round in August, um, but really both of them did not get, they were not able to get over 50% of the votes. Um, and uh, Torres only got 15.7%, Arevalo got 11.8%. These are extremely low percentages um, for uh, for this first round, not showing much confidence in really anyone. Um, so it definitely interesting first round. Um, and it's important to point out that, uh, that these results, that this low participation, the protest vote, these very low numbers of how many of, you know, even the people who are going on to the next round is all because of what's happened with this electoral process up until now. And what was the electoral process itself like? So as I mentioned, there has been a quite a turbulent um, uh, precedent for these elections. Um, you know, of course, the electoral process took place on June 25th, but the whole electoral process leading up to this date when people are casting their votes really created this situation of mistrust, of, of confusion, and of um, lack of confidence in the process. And this is largely due to the fact that many, many, many candidates were actually excluded uh, by the Supreme Electoral Tribunal. Um, and specifically, a lot of, I mean, on one hand, candidates from the left, but even candidates from the center, from the right. But very specifically, there was a candidate, uh, Thelma Cabrera, who's from the Movement for Liberation of Peoples, MLP, quite popular candidate, uh, had been really rising in the polls and was seen for many as a left alternative. She was excluded. Um, another candidate who was leading the voter intention polls with 22%. And if we remember these uh, in the first round, people were only getting uh, we're getting even less than that. Um, so who the leader in the voter intention polls, uh, Pineda, he was Carlos Pineda, he was also disqualified from Citizen Prosperity Party. Uh, so a lot of these exclusions were uh, justified on procedural grounds that people didn't turn in all of the documents that they were supposed to. Um, very, very small um, administrative arguments, but really what it chalks up to is trying to create a situation in which um, those who are going to be favorable to the interests of the ruling class, and of course that means not someone like Dama Carrera, who's from a people's movement, who's been fighting to get electricity for different communities across the country, um, are not going to be <laughs> allowed to run. And so I think uh, when we look at this low participation, this low turnout, uh, this is really uh, in response to these um, crackdown, but also, of course, a broader situation of repression. Um, just weeks before these votes were held, um, a journalist who we uh, we wrote about on People's Dispatch, Jose Ruin Zamora, who had been uh, arrested back in July 2022, he was sentenced to six years in prison. And uh, Zamora was the editor of a 
important newspaper in Guatemala that had been investigating crimes of corruption, which, of course, uh, if you've been following Guatemalan politics over the past several years, this is the key word, corruption. It's been mobilizing people onto the streets. It's it's a buzzword in politics. And this journalist had uncovered several crimes of the Alejandro Giametti government. And what do you know? He ends up in prison and sentenced to six years. So all of these elements are very, very important to take into account uh, when talking about these elections. As I said, there's going to be a second round in August, and it that will be uh, the defining moment for who's going to be the next president. But I think one thing is sure, and that is that the people are not, uh, do not feel satisfied, do not feel listened to, do not feel like uh, right now the electoral politics in the country are able to actually respond to their needs, and actually is a uh, and. And furthermore, that it doesn't even uh, represent a legitimate process. So we'll definitely be following those events at People's Dispatch. Thanks a lot for that, Zoe. China is hosting its first in-person World Economic Forum, also known as Summer Davos, since the COVID-19 pandemic. The discussions will go on for three days in Tianjin City. There are delegations from all over the world attending sessions focused on this year's theme, entrepreneurship. Barbados, Mongolia, New Zealand and Vietnam are sending prime ministers to attend, adding to the diplomatic significance of the event. Anish from People's Dispatch has more details of this gathering. Anish, let's begin with first things first. What is the event all about? What is the significance of this event? Well, the event as such is not as significant considering the uh, the the array of leaders that will be in China uh, and or has been in China so far, and who uh, who will be meeting with the leaders there. And I think that's far far more significant. There are four prime ministers this uh, week itself. Uh, scheduled to be visiting, including the Barbadian Prime Minister and the New Zealand Prime Minister. We already saw a foreign minister's visit by uh, New Zealand, and uh, she has already made statements uh, indicating a very positive response, not just from China, and but also the fact that that will be significant progress. Now, obviously, the countries that will be uh, in China, like the leaders of the countries in China, will not are not the ones, the usual suspects that we usually look at in the anti-China uh, barrage, but definitely it includes definitely uh, New Zealand, who always has tried to balance between uh, US and China, at least under the current uh, uh, Labour government or even the previous Labour government under Jacinda Ardern. Uh, what, what is quite significant is how these countries are trying to make uh, their relations with China pretty much about the things that matter to them, which is A, uh, trade and B, climate change. Now, these are obviously uh, small countries. Many of them will be affected by climate change. And obviously, they require a big, big uh, powers and great powers to actually uh, make commitments and also to invest in their uh, in their commitments for, uh, you know, for uh, addressing or mitigating climate change related disasters. So these are quite significant, not just geopolitically, but also in the overall you know, global politics of it, despite, I mean, like they are generally seen as, uh, you know, as uh, some media reports would uh, tell you, uh, as back backyards of certain countries, but that's not how it is. As Mia Motley had already uh, very, uh, you know, uh, quite a while back uh, when she became the prime minister, she actually made the statements how it is just, uh, uh, just a sort of a very uh, US-centric kind of worldview where everything is their backyard and not really... Uh, looking at countries as sovereigns themselves with independent decision-making powers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have to also see the run-up to these uh, meetings uh, where, uh, I mean, like one of the examples would be very recently how uh, Chris Hipkins uh, very much distanced himself from the U.S. president's statement of uh, calling Xi Jinping a dictator. Now, a very uh, irresponsible statement on the a part of President Biden uh, and also made at a fundraiser in a manner that uh, pretty much the language which was pretty much uh, echoing of Trump era, uh, you know, uh, boasting and boastful languages that we, can, we would have seen at the time where he talked about, uh, you know, shooting down a balloon and stuff like that. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we are seeing uh, very clear attempts to pressure these countries into, you know, towing the line of the United States and their allies, 
We have seen very recently Australia trying to make uh, moves in the region and not just with New Zealand, but also in the Pacific region with smaller countries trying to, uh, you know, broker trade deals, but not just trade deals, but also security deals uh, that of obviously uh, are, you know, uh, tailored in a manner that tries to keep China out. We have also seen in the case of Barbados, uh, a lot of uh, US pressure put, being put on the island uh, in trying to, in terms of at least the propaganda machinery that we see, very obviously talking about any kind of Chinese projects there uh, or China related projects there uh, being, uh, you know, some sort of death trap or some kind of uh, a trap to, uh, you know, rope in uh, these nations and and into being their so, sort of satellites. And that is the kind of language that you have to use. So coming at a time like this, when US-China tensions are high, these meetings are going to be quite significant. Smaller as they, these countries might be, they are definitely key geopolitical locations for everybody included. And also uh, significant, uh, significantly their independent stand on their sovereign issues have also brought them to attention on various stages as well. Right, Anish. So what you say, it seems as if the, uh, the meeting is going to be as much a diplomatic event as it is a trade event. Yes, definitely. So the diplomacy matter uh, is quite significant here. Uh, we are already seeing certain neighbors in uh, neighborhood uh, in uh, the East Asia becoming flashpoints of future conflict, uh, as right. we can see. And uh, it has actually uh, accelerated. Even last week, when we talked about uh, the uh, the Blinken uh, visit to Beijing and his meeting with top officials in uh, in China, uh, just shortly after that, we saw not just that very responsible statement by Biden, but also uh, you know multiple uh, maneuvers, uh, military maneuvers in the Taiwan Strait and uh, in the South China Sea by the United States. Uh, very clearly showing and exhibiting that uh, it's not really a resolution that really matters to them. Uh, for them, it's uh, these kind of meetings are basically just at this point, uh, uh, just a show, uh, just a matter of uh, photo op to show that they have tried to um, uh, use diplomacy when diplomacy, like the commitments that they make in these diplomatic events are not very clearly spoken of. Now, on the other hand, the countries that we've seen that have tried to seriously make, uh, you know, take their relations with China uh, have taken their commitments whenever they, whenever they held their meetings far more seriously. And these are some of these countries uh, that we're looking at. Uh, New Zealand, for instance, as I say, keep saying, like the fact that it is uh, pretty, it pretty much falls within the Anglo-Saxon uh, in a sphere of influence and right. definitely it has the same kind of very much every single marker of any other Anglo-Saxon country. We have a very anti-China uh, sort of an anti uh, and a pro-US sort of media uh, ecosystem there, a propaganda machinery that pretty much looks at anything Chinese that uh, very suspiciously. Even very recently we saw uh, seen uh, the RSZ being at the uh, at, uh, at a sort of uh, not just not a necessarily a diplomatic uh, scandal, but uh, a, a scandal in its own, where they try to make it out that a certain editing within on uh, on articles about Russia and the Ukraine war, and try to you know crack down on that. And like right. these edits were not that big a deal, and it kind of gave a very balanced overview. But even that was something that was. Uh, looked down upon and, you know, very, uh, very much uh, a matter of witch hunt. Even the editor himself was being, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, targeted for being so pro-Russian at the time. And uh, this happened quite recently. And this, uh, in an atmosphere like that, when the New Zealand leadership takes a stand, it's not necessarily a stand in the sense that they're trying to be neutral in many ways. They do not want to take sides. They do not want to put themselves in jeopardy and their sovereign interests. But the fact that something like this would be, you know, not only covered that widely, but also be discussed as a matter of whether they are changing their perspective or changing their stand on things shows how significant these meetings are. And like, as I said, like as much as trade and other matters are quite significant in these cases, uh, the diplomacy of this event and the fact that the world at large, even within the, uh, the pro-US circles and the sphere of influences that we talk about, uh, there are uh, independent opinions and diverging opinions within them. 
shows uh, is quite clearly seen in this uh, sort of in this set of meetings that we are not that does not only happen but is uh, are said to happen in the coming days. Right, Anish. Thanks very much for joining us. And that's all for today. Thanks very much for watching Daily Debrief. We look forward to seeing you with another episode on Wednesday. Our regular updates are on peoplesdispatch.org and our social media channels on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Our YouTube channel has more stories and this show, Daily Debrief. Thank you again for watching.